in this room, we're going to have Todd and Tanya Cranmore talking about prosthetics care. They are from Northwest Eye Design, one of our sponsors. We're grateful for them. And in track two, they're going to be having a panel with the ACS research board member, Kevin, and Dr. Wade, Dr. Katz, and Lucy Innes, um, who's going to be there. They're going to talk about research money and what does or does not equal a cure, and what really gets a drug to market. They're also going to cover a little bit around clinical trials. So those of you who are here, we're glad you're here. Those of you who are in the other room, um, we hope you come back and catch this recording. So with that said, I'm going to introduce our next speakers. So thank you guys for being here for our 11 a.m. session. We're getting started at one minute after. We're doing good. Okay. So let me just introduce both of our speakers here. They are uh, a team of ocularists, and Todd Cranmore is a licensed ocularist, ocularist here in Washington State, and a board-certified ocularist, and a board-approved diplom diplomat, di diplomate, diplomate, ocularist, uh, B-A-D-O is the abbreviation, very cool. And uh, combining medicine, artistry, and engineering, he creates the amazing replicas of the natural eye. Uh, along with his education in ocular prosthetics, he's earned a degree in biochemistry from the University of Washington, and he loves to hang out with his family, prefers to be out on the water boating, and loves to wake surf. Tanya, his wife, is an apprentice ocularist, combining her creativity and compassion to care for others. She's a graduate of the University of Washington with a Bachelor of Arts degree, and she values the opportunity to partner with her husband, Todd, and the whole team through re rewarding work at Northwest Eye Design. She enjoys also being with family and friends, game nights, volunteering, walks, and hikes. So I'm grateful to have you guys here. We'll go ahead and welcome you both to the stage. And just so you know, you guys do have a pointer if you need it, and I, can, I believe you have slides as well, right? Yes, okay, so you can each have a clicker, and you can each use a mic, and then if you need to point with a laser, that's this guy right here. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, thank you for having us here today, and uh, thank you for the very nice introduction. So we're going to talk a little bit about how do we make a prosthetic, and then how do we care for prosthetics. So there might be some surprises in here. I might say some things that uh, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. So we did want to bring a little bit of um, information about what um, maybe some things that could be helpful for, for those that don't have a prosthetic as well, some of the impacts of vision loss. Just looking at our topics today, I wanted to try to round out some of the things that we're learning from patients and, and have seen over the years. Um, so we want to talk about some resources for patients that are not just entirely related to prosthetics, but also vision loss and, um, and uh, dry eye. Sure. So um, one of the first things that we will talk with a patient about is how are they feeling about their eye loss? How are they feeling about uh, vision changes? And a lot of times what we'll see from patients is anxiety. There's a lot of patients that are going through all the losses of uh, depression and acceptance and um, much, you know, losing a body part is much like losing a, um, a family member or a pet. There's a lot of stages that you'll go through in, in that. Fear of blindness, for sure, as uh, many of our patients have lost one eye, they're concerned about losing the other or, or the risk of losing the other. Um, the loss of depth perception and changes in the vision. And um, again, speaking to a patient that's, that's lost one eye, um, there's about a 15 or 20% loss of peripheral vision, which um, can be kind of, you know, a lot of times people are going to say, I lost half my, half my vision. Well, no, you, you lost about 15 or 20% of perif peripheral vision, but um, thankfully our, our primary gaze and um, vision from the front is still, still covers quite a bit of our range. One of the biggest things that we see from patients, though, is this, is, we hear it over and over, is that life goes on. And that regardless of those changes, regardless of how the, the psychological impacts are affecting them, is that they move on and they're, they're supported by their family, they're encouraged. And um, you know, as, as Dr. Stacy was saying, a lot of patients are, are leaving a place of pain and, and moving into a place of not having pain. And, um, and those, those are the encouragements that I see from patients.
So now we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the I loss specifically. So um, this first picture is a picture of inoculation. That's when there was removal of the whole eye orbit, and then we're preserving the um, orbital structures. So there's several different reasons why they may, that might happen. Um, the endo, I can never pronounce that word. Can you pronounce that? <laughs> Endophthalmitis. <laughs> That's an um, infection in, in the eye, and then a blind painful eye, ocular trauma, or a malignant tumor. Um, so the implant is placed in the socket, and then we can um, fit a prosthesis about six to eight weeks following that surgery. Another type of, uh, we're going to talk about three different types of eye loss surgery here. The, the second type is an evisceration. Evisceration is not uh, indicated for uh, a tumor. This is, uh, a lot of patients that we will see will have this surgery. It looks almost identical uh, from externally, but internally there's a lot of differences. The, the, the white of the eye of the sclera is remaining intact. The, uh, the iris and the, and the, and the um, cornea are removed optic nerves often removed, and then the interior contents of the inside of the eye are removed. So the muscles never get detached. They stay on the sclera, and then the sclera becomes part of the, part of the um, wrap around the orbital implant. Mechanically, um, almost identical to a, a nucleation. Uh, risk factors are a little higher with this. Um, there's a little bit less removal or, or disruption of the contents of the globe, and that's why, as, as a, from a mechanical standpoint, we really like it uh, uh, from, the, from the results. However, I will say that um, we almost can never tell the difference if, if the surgical technique is excellent, whether the evisceration was done or a nucleation was done. Uh, the third type we're going to talk about is oneration. This is when um, things are a little more advanced. The, uh, either the tumor or infection or injury goes beyond the globe into the, into the eyelids, into the surrounding tissues, the bones. Um, and, and these defects can be quite large or um, uh, and, um, and pretty debilitating for us to be able to replace that volume. And so we make a prosthesis, um, uh, let's see, I think we're actually gonna talk about it in a moment. Uh, so this is a picture here of a couple of the implants um, and the, ver the variety of implants. So the silicone sphere, good compatibility. The uh, second one is an acrylic sphere, also good compatibility. The porous sphere is also known as the bio eye or med pore eye, and it's great uh, tissue integration. Um, and then the dermal fat, that is your own, um, your own fat that's put back into the, um, into the socket and has, also has excellent biocompatibility. Okay. And then, um, then briefly, we'll, uh, there's, there's four different types of prosthetic devices that we, that we work with. Um, the first is conformer. It's the clear shape that's in place after the surgery, if it's an evisceration or a nucleation. Uh, prosthetic eye, um, which is our um, is contact-like lens uh, prosthetic. A scleral shell, which is also a contact lens-like uh, um, prosthetic. The biggest difference is what we're fitting on top of. If there's sclera, in place either the evisceration or it's a, uh, an existing eye that we're fitting on, then we call it a scleral shell, and there's some differences in how we make that and fit that, but um, any, if a person looking at you and, and seeing it isn't gonna probably look any different from the outside. Um, the orbital prosthesis is our, our fourth one there. That's a little more involved, larger piece. Um, it's made out of silicone, eyelids are reproduced, and eyebrows sometimes, those are really hard to do. Um, but the, um, the overall appearance and, um, um, and, and reproduction of that can be quite nice for a patient. And, um, and often the biggest part of this is the seams. Uh, I finished a gentleman earlier this week that has a, um, just a really nice result, but um, the biggest area is often we can see the seams around that. Um, that can be managed well with eyeglasses and um, um, can look a little bit like wearing a really um, fancy, fancy Band-Aid. <laughs> um, but it can, it can be really a nice result. 
So after surgery, um, usually about two weeks after, we love to see patients come in to get a conformer. There's a pretty generic for conformer that you get um, right after surgery, and then about two weeks later, we can replace it with one that's gonna reach more to the edges of the socket so that we're getting the formation of the fornices that we really want over the next several weeks while it's healing. Um, so six to eight weeks out is when we would um, want to um, get that conformer in. Um, so then there's four to five appointments to make the prosthesis um, from the designing and um, just our painting and all of the, all the steps that happen. You're gonna see that next in some of our slides here, but um, uh, yeah. All right, so we're gonna um, we're gonna jump in real quickly and talk about um, why prosthesis. What are some of the effects for patients? And so um, there's definitely some cycle. There's definitely some uh, physiological benefits of having a prosthesis in there. The the tear film is preserved. Uh, the the volume of the eyelids bringing everything back to normal. Uh, there's some there's some benefits to the uh, protection of the mucosal tissues. Um, there's definitely uh, uh, can help with risk of infection and having that, having that piece in there. And um, we'll talk about how often this should be removed in a minute. Um, but the, um, the overall is there's some great benefits of having a piece in there. Of course, the cosmetic restoration, which uh, is some of the more fun parts of that, um, certainly for us and for patients to be able to put some of those pieces back together that um, is, is, is just an absolute blessing for us to be able to do. Um, there's also emotional well-being, the, the boost in self-esteem, your eye is part of your face, and, and being able to help kind of put some of those things back together for us is fantastic. And for patients to look at us after looking in a mirror and say, wow, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm back. I, I, and just, we've seen patients that have had hair covering their eyes for years, and, and we see them come back from the bathroom with their hairs back, or they put makeup on, or they uh, take that tape off the glasses, and there's just so many of those reveal moments that we just are so blessed to be able to see and be part of. And so um, for us, I would say those are some of our bigger benefits. Um, and aside, all these photos in here are our patients. These are all people that we know and love, and. Um, they're not supermodels, uh, but they actually are supermodels. <laughs> and so um, they're just not paid for it. Um, but, um, but they're just, these, they really are all patients. And um, like Tanya would say, they all, they all have stories and they all tell us all their stories and we love it. And unfortunately, then they get our stories. <laughs> so we're gonna talk real quickly about shells. So uh, we did kind of mention a lot of these things already, but um, the scleral shell is usually, you have an, a, had an evisceration. Um, so the, some of the things reasons would be you have an, you've had an accident or you have a tysical globe, which is a smaller globe, or um, retinal detachment, um, glaucoma, um, infection, or if you just want to improve the cosmesis of, a, of an eye, Maybe the eye is damaged, um, and you, we can put a very thin scleral shell over it to match the existing eye. A lot of times we'll have conversations with patients that uh, there was a man, went 40 years. He had a, had a globe that looked a lot like this. He didn't know there was any other option. He, he went to you know, different things, doctor visits, nobody ever mentioned it. And so we, we always like to circle back and talk about shells. And uh, we, we fit a lot of shells. And, and um, f for us, it's in a lot of ways great. You don't have to have surgery if there's not pain, if there's not infection, there's not a reason to have an eye taken out that we can actually fit right on top of it. Now, also, um, I have some in my pocket. Um, <laughs> So we'll pull them out later here. Um, uh, that sounded weird. Um, <laughs> I really do. It's in one of my pockets. Anyhow, we will pull those out in a moment. Um, and so anyone wants to come and look at them later. A shell can be made really thin. So let's move on to some of our before and afters. Uh, this gentleman's got a little bit of room in there. Um, and you can see this lid's more closed like, like Dr. Stacy was, was uh, describing after nucleation, but he has a, has a tysical globe in there, which is a small eye. This little guy, um, we see a lot of kiddos. Uh, this guy's got a, um, a, 
also a little bit of a collapsed globe and a, a damaged eye in there. And then the one I wanted you to see here is we can actually fit a, like even less than a millimeter thin uh, shell. And you can see how on her, on her natural eye, it's almost larger than her, um, than her, than her other, her, her right eye. And so we can fit quite a thin shell, even, even, you know, we can always be challenged at how thin we can make a shell. Uh, I'm mean, happy to have that challenge. But as long as we can make an improvement in the way of, it looks and the way a patient feels about it. So we do see a lot of children, um, whether it's from retinoblastoma, that's a big one, um, or trauma, infection, or again, uh, or uh, anophthalmia with uh, no eye. Um, so we can do, we can make them a prosthetic eye and if that's a need, or we can also do shells for, collateral shells for kids too. Um, and that would be if they had a small eye, the microphthalmia, we fit over that. If they have ROP or PHPV or Coats disease. So there are many reasons why we would come alongside kids. Okay, so we're gonna dig in now to how we actually make an eye. So um, the, the process of making an eye is very much hands-on. It's all made by hand, it's all made in our office. And um, both Tanya and I have uh, just love, love the process, love to work through the process with patients, and it's a very close process. When we are working in, you know, we're, we're really in somebody's face, I think. Uh, for us, it's like, does, we don't think twice about getting this close to somebody and like staring at Some their face. Some of these people in this room know that. <laughs> 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 so sorry about that. But anyhow, um, it is, it's super fun for us. So we're going to take you through the process and, and how we do it all. So this is the first, one of the first steps that we do. That's a silicone impression. So it's a conformer with some holes around the edges. And then you see the bigger hole in the middle where we have a straw. And that impression material goes in there. It's gooey, cold, and takes about two minutes to set up. But what that gives us is the shape of the socket at that point. And then our goal is to keep that the same and to not make any changes to the shape of the, of, of the um, prosthesis as we're, walk, as we're going through the process. And we try to use just the right amount of material every time so that <laughs> it doesn't go all over anybody's face or make a mess of them. Mm -hmm. So once we have that perfectly formed shape, we then duplicate it out of wax. And so the wax piece then is, can be tried on and we can actually see how it feels. We can see how the eyelids respond. We can see the form, the function, the movement. There's a lot of pieces all at the same time that are coming together. And then we begin, once everything's comfortable, moving well, um, aligned well, then we begin to line up where the iris is gonna go in that. And that's when we start our artwork and we're just doing radial paint, painting and adding the details and using the patient as the model coming in real close looking and just adding in all those details. Okay, and I, I would say, you know, looking back, you wanna go back? Yeah, this is kind of a fun one to go. You can see how much detail gets added in and all the different patterns and the, uh, the blends. We're really trying to duplicate as much anatomy as we can. There's a lot of anatomy packed into that um, tenor, uh, you know, I guess I should know how big it is. <laughs> 20, 20 millimeter, no, 12 millimeter uh, um, disc that um, there's just a lot of detail. And a lot of times, I, if someone had commented this week when they saw their eye, they, they were like, wow, it, it, it like, like looks like it's alive. It looks like it's, it's muscle. And that's, that's what we're after. That's, that is really what we're trying to achieve. So this is a little video of a uh, sped up version of seeing the um, iris be painted. How long does it take to do an iris? Mm, 45 minutes. <laughs> okay. This will be a lot faster. <laughs> Here you go, sped up version. So this is just the initial um, coloring and then starting to add in some of the radial details. We, we often um, use white 
to start out. Um, if, we're, if it's a blue eye, we actually don't ever really use blue until the end. It's just the white on the black will create kind of a, a blue hue. Um, so the blues come in sometimes, but um, you can see now Todd's adding more of the details around the collarette area. Um, the pupil will be right in the middle shortly. Pupil size is a big one. We have to decide how large to make that, and that's going to, of course, fluctuate depending on the light that the patient is in the rest of their life. So it's a big decision to make, but uh, we make that together and, uh, and try to pick a size that works pretty well for like normal conversational distance for someone. So still adding all the details. And then um, he's going to go around the very edge soon here, which gives us what's called the collarette, which um, some of us have a really strong outer rim um, of coloration. And so that's what he's doing there. Yeah, that's, a, that's the limbal. Oh, sorry, limbal the, the, the yeah. limbus. Yeah, the limbus. Uh -huh. Collarettes <laughs> around the pupil, yeah. Yeah, that's the, or, the kind of the orange color you're seeing. That's the color, and the limbus is the one, the outer rim. Tanya and I spend a lot of time talking about limbus as colorettes. <laughs> 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 Take that for what you will. Um, we talk a lot about work, and uh, one of the greater things for <clears throat> us is, is we like to push into it. We really want to have it be as accurate and um, as, as lifelike as possible. And... It's a, it's a difficult thing to do, but it is so important. And so um, this tiny little piece of real estate on our face has got so much detail in it, and we really want it to come alive. So um, so here we are. We've, we will uh, cap it with clear acrylic now. We also put a second blend on it, which is called a limbal blend, um, which is also helps with the realism of our, of our limbus, and it makes it look like the artwork of the iris is embedded into the rest of the um, sclera of the eye. Uh, and then we duplicate the um, vessels in the scleral with um, pigments, and um, we use silk red thread that we um, fray with a, um, a razor blade, and then add in the yellows and blues on top. And we actually have a video of this too. This is um, when family members come, uh, this is probably one of the steps that is the most uh, kind of come alive moments where, I mean, obviously at the end when we're putting in the final prosthesis, that's the really the moment, but this is a fun one for, for folks to watch because it really starts to come alive at this stage. You can see our silk threads being put on here and um, Often we are surprised at how much pigmentation and um, and and how much silk is needed for some for some of our folks. Um, you feel like you got oh we got so much on the counter here and then we put it in and we're like where'd it go? <laughs> there's no uh, there's no red and and at the same time the patient's looking at us saying you've made me bloodshot <laughs> and, and I'm like well wait no no it's gonna it'll come out in the end you'll see uh there's a lot of trust going on there especially with the red thread for some reason we have to overemphasize our colors because once it's in the socket it's going to change and not look quite the same yeah but this is i like this this um part of the process because it really makes it come all together and looks more lifelike and um looks more like the person that we're making the prosthesis for so uh, one thing to note is oftentimes if you have a uh, darker pigment in your skin, we tend to have more yellows, and the younger you are, you tend to have more blues, but it can also be all over the place too. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the, the final uh, part for the prosthesis here is to get an optical uh, clear over the entire surface so it's all smooth and ready to be, to be worn. And then here's our final prosthesis ready to be tried on. And this is what I have in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone is welcome when we're done here, I'll pull these out um, to come take a look. Oh, tattoos. Yeah, another yeah. fun thing we like to do is 
at the very top, you can see at the top of the prosthesis, there's space there, and your eyelid hits the top of um, of the iris, and so we like to use that little space to do fun little designs if people want to. We've done almost anything you could think of on the top. Lots of yes. sports logos, lots of, there's some angels out there, you know, yes. all sorts of things we've put up top. Right. So. Yeah, and a, a lot of times we'll get questions from patients about doing a fun eye or something different. We like to joke about that, but mostly what we're here about is we'll, we we'll try to put all the, it's like a, what's the thing, the hair piece that some people wear? Was it? Nope, nobody said it yet. A wig? Nope. No, it's a, not, I'm, hair piece is the wrong word. Hairstyle. Um, what's the, like the, something where the guy wears it and there's like long hair in the. A mullet. Mullet. A mullet. That's it. Yeah, we like to hide our mullets. So we like to have fun up here, but then, you know, not have it be on the front. So, um, but I think we definitely are getting a lot of requests from patients to do more and more things. And, um, and that's, that's where we, we say, nope, we can't do that, but we will put a little we'll have some special fun on, top. on the top. So. The mullet. There, sorry, sorry to come around circle on that. There you go. Uh, now I just want to talk about how to take care of the prosthesis. Um, you know, they're easily removed with a suction cup or using your, your fingers to remove it. As long You just want to make sure you have clean hands. Um, it's held in place by the eyelids, um, upper and lower eyelid. And then, you know, most patients can wear their prosthesis full time. Um, those with scleral shell may, um, may remove at night, but a lot can still wear it full time. Um, and we really um, advocate for wearing the prosthesis full time. We really um, feel like the best scenario is to put it in and just leave it alone. It's going to feel better. It's going to have less drainage. It's going to have less infections. It's just going to feel better the least amount of times you interact with it. So we talk more and more with patients about, you know what, you don't even need to take it out unless it's bothering you. An eyelash back there, yes, take it out, wash it off, put it back in. But um, we really just encourage everyone to just wear it full time. So we've had a bit of a shift. And Dr. Stacey, you, you had uh, mentioned this and said something about me being 10 feet away. Um, I think that uh, I absolutely would have said, oh, yeah, you should take it out about every two or three weeks. In fact, that's what our instructions said. But we changed them over the last couple of years because Tanya kept noticing that patients were doing better if they just left it in place. And so, uh, so many patients now will come in and, and we're, we just say, don't touch it. Don't touch it if it's bothersome eye drop that you know rather than removing it because when you take it out you're taking all the tissue uh, not tissue the, tear the moisture with tear film with it so we'll um, we'll circle back to that in a moment here with um, and actually a lot of the thoughts on leaving it in more came from lectures we've heard in the national organization we're part of and um, the surgeon saying just tell your patients not to take the prosthesis out you're just going to have much better comfort and it's going to respond better and you're going to have less issues so we really just are encouraging people to do that yeah so yeah. my ocularist um, he the way that he explained it is that essentially the eye the eye prosthesis develops a film over time and that microbiome gets disrupted every time you take it out. And so if you take it out every day, then yep. it never can develop that microbiome that allows it to feel comfortable and allow the discharge to reduce. Perfect. Right. Exactly um, right. So yeah, the people that I see who are like, oh, my eye is droopy and goopy all the time. I'm like, just, I will tell you to leave it alone. If your doctor told you differently, then listen to your doctor, but also like maybe try it and see if it works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the best time to start that is right after you've had it polished yeah. and then you just because keep it in. And we tell people, if you come back and you haven't taken it out and it's been six months later, hooray, doesn't it feel amazing? And they're like, it really does. So, right. yeah. Yeah. So um, handling the prosthesis, removing, taking it out is all, it's really pretty simple. There isn't mechanically very much to it. We have some tools. There's a suction cup that's outlined here. There's also fingers that seem to be um, available for most folks. Um, and the, you know, when, when we're talking about taking it out, a lot of times patients get a little squeamish about that. I don't want to take it out. And a family member ends up doing it or a parent. <laughs> yeah, there's some, gag some giggles out there. Uh, it's really not that bad. Uh, but of course, you know, it is uh, it a lot. Of I, every day someone says to me, oh, you're so good at that. I'm like, well, I do it all day long. <laughs> um, I, and I'm out here. You know, it's different when you're not in the face. And so anyhow, um, it, 
in general, it's mechanically very simple to remove. Um, and then um, when, uh, when, when you take the eye out, and hopefully in little amounts, um, or, if, or if your physician is taking it out, the things that we want a surgeon or an ophthalmologist or optometrist to look for are look at the prosthesis. Is there any scratches? Is there any buildup of protein? Um, we want to look at the socket. Is there anything going on in there that shouldn't be? Um, and then also um, having, having to make sure that uh, it's being polished on a regular basis is really important. And we're also looking for all those things too. And if we see something that's concerning, like the um, there's irritation in there or the socket is bright red, then we're going to refer back to the doctor and say they need a steroid, they need an antibiotic, because we can't refer, we can't um, prescribe that, but we can refer back to the doctor to make sure their tissue gets healed. So. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that um, for for many patients, I really wish they could just have an antibiotic and a steroid in their back pocket that they could just pull out as needed, but it doesn't really work that way. And so um, uh, that that relationship's real important. We already maybe mentioned a little bit of these things, but just you know, if you do take the prosthesis out, it's just warm water is great. Rubbing it in your fingers, if you need to, a mild soap. Um, and just washing it really well. You never want to soak it in any sanitizers, alcohols, or anything like that. That'll damage the, or toothpaste, or anything like that. That will damage the prosthesis. So um, just warm water and a little bit of soap. Definitely don't use mouthwash. <laughs> don't use mouthwash. We've, we've heard of people use quite a few things. Or product <laughs> at all. Yeah. yeah. It seems to be, I'm not sure why. I think the internet, unfortunately, has some, <laughs> something somewhere out there about that. Um, we, uh, one of the talks, uh, Dr. Nguyen was talking about uh, microbes and things that might come in tap water. One of the things that we would tell patients if they're traveling or, or, or if they're on well, or it, if there's a place where you are that you wouldn't drink the water, we're encouraging not to use that water to, to clean your prosthesis with. So you use, um, saline. You know, say either like a saline or, or, or bottled water. Don't use alcohol as much as that is, um, <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of jokes about that. But that's uh, in general, like I mean, drinking alcohol. Don't use that. Um, the the rubbing alcohol really will crack the acrylic, and so even though that's used in a lot of other places in medicine to clean things, it actually will crack our um, our acrylic because of the the heat and the and the pressure we're putting it under to create it. So putting the eye back in right away, really ideally, um, the same way it came out, upper lid first and then sliding all the way in, and a suction cup's a great tool. Um, we're always gonna advocate for um, polishes every six months. It really is the perfect timing. Most people kind of two weeks before, they're like, my eye is bugging me. And then they look and they go, oh, I have an appointment in two weeks. No wonder, I need it polished. So we disinfect it with, H or with um, hydrogen peroxide. We're looking for a response. If there's a bubbling up of that, then we're gonna send you, recommend maybe you see the doctor your um, eye doctor, if you have some type of um, reaction in there. Um, we're gonna polish it with our um, Dremel tools and our, um, uh, and then we're gonna, when we do that, we're removing the proteins, the bacterias, and um, any minute little scratches on there. And we're re-smoothing the surface of the prosthesis, which makes it much more comfortable. It makes your eyelids happier. It's got something smooth to blink on. And um, so polishing is a really important step in maintaining the health of your socket and your prosthesis. Um, and we're looking in there at your tissue and um, addressing anything that we see and then we're also looking to make sure it's always fitting properly, aligned properly. We're looking at eyelids and making sure that they're still, um, you know, where we want them to be. And you know, if we see any um, significant changes, then we kind of start to have those conversations about replacement. But um, typically, a prosthetic eye can last at least five years. Um, but we're always making sure that um, we're assessing that fit all along the way. So, yeah, perfect dovetailing for me into, uh, we do expect about five years. Uh, some patients go a long time. Uh, some only make it a couple. It depends on how much the tissue changes. Uh, immediately after surgery, we see a lot of swelling and edema that'll go down over the next year. 
And so almost always we're doing adjustments to the prosthesis once or twice the first year after surgery. And then after that, much more stable. So um, mostly stable. Um, and um, the, the challenge with trying to know whether it needs to be polished or replaced is the symptoms are about the same. Uh, there's itchiness, dryness, uh, in, infections, droopiness. There's a lot of those symptoms can be resolved with a replacement of the prosthesis. Some of them cannot. Um, we definitely have a great relationship with, uh, with our surgeons that are um, helping us where we can't do more, especially with eyelids and, and re redoing tissue and uh, tightening things. There's definitely things over time that, that really could be beneficial to have lids lifted or, or things tightened. Um, we would love to say we could do it all with plastic and the prosthesis, but we definitely can't. There's, there's gonna be a point at which um, uh, a uh, surgeon or fillers or things like that would be beneficial for a patient. And because the eyelid, the lower eyelid especially, is a pretty weak muscle, if you have been wearing a prosthesis for a while, the weight of the prosthesis on that lower lid is going to affect the droopiness. And so sometimes that is when um, we need to replace or we, we would recommend eyelid surgery. This is a shout out to my mom. It's her birthday tomorrow. Uh, she and her... Uh, I worked together for about 20 years, and uh, this is one of my favorite pictures of her because she was always in people's faces and always smiling. <laughs> so um, other things that we would think about, we kind of already touched about antibiotics. Um, it, we talked about keeping it in for long periods of time. Um, allergies, we haven't talked about that. So allergies affect a lot of patients and smoke. Um, anything that would be more stuff in the air, even if a patient didn't have allergies, I would say they're going to have allergic type response in wearing a prosthesis. If a patient doesn't have dry eye, they're going to have a dry eye-like response to having a prosthesis in there because there's almost twice the surface area that needs to be lubricated in there when you add in a prosthesis. You have your existing eyelids, you have your existing front of either the implant or your existing eye that's in there, and then you have the addition of us putting a prosthetic um, piece in there that's got a front and back to it. So the actual surface area is, there's four different surfaces that need to be lubricated versus two in, in a non-prosthetic socket. So the, de the demand for, for need of uh, lubrication in there is, is almost twice. Plus, you're also touching it, hopefully not much. But if you do, uh, one thing that we're really encouraging patients to not use is a Kleenex. Um, we actually want you to use a Kleenex, but we don't want you to touch the surface with a Kleenex because what we're finding, I don't know why this took me 25 or 26 years to get to, but when you touch a prosthetic with your Kleenex, you can't feel it. And so I have had um, rather... Um, hilarious conversations with patients and I put a lubricant in there right after we polished it and then I'm telling them not to touch it with the thing and they touched it with the thing. They went right up and took that Kleenex and touched it to the front and took all the moisture away. And I, oh, wait, wait, we just, <laughs> we just talked about this. And oh, I didn't touch it. <laughs> you did. <laughs> I was watching you, and and uh, the, and it's it's dry in there again. So I put a drop on again, and then you know the drop spills all over their face. This is, seems to be my recurring thing, and um, I love that Dr. Wen was like, "How do you put eye drops in?" Um, and so they're all over their cheek, and so they come up with the Kleenex, and they took it again, and they touched it to the surface of the of the prosthesis again, and I'm like, "This happens to me every day." So I'm like, "Well." <laughs> You just touched it again. I'm like, no, I didn't. I, you know, I just touched my cheek because all you can feel is your cheek and your eyelids, and and with a prosthesis, and you're not going to feel the cornea. You're not going to feel the sclera. If I touched my other eye and, and uh, touched the sclera of the cornea with a Kleenex, I'm going to know it. But on a prosthesis, you could do it all day long. You won't even know that you touched it. But the tear film goes immediately into that sponge of the of the Kleenex. So, so our recommendation is you shut the eyelid and just dab the outside. Right. And try to figure out how to get these drops in there. <laughs> so this, uh, you know, there are lubricants just for the prosthesis. Um, 
They're great because they don't have preservatives. You can use them as needed. There's no, like, just whenever it, you feel like you need it. We suggest a little drop of the oil right on a clean finger and then just rub it right on the prosthesis and then drop some tears over the top. Um, and again, you know, letting that all soak in um, rather than wiping it away. Um, uh, for, tear, for tears, we've learned over the years that um, we're move, we have moved away from suggesting anything that has a preservative in it, because with the preservatives, you have a limited amount of drops that you can use. I believe it's four, like in Pretty. the whole day. Um, so we love preservative-free tears. There's a lot of great ones out there. There's so many, um, but that would be our recommendation to use those because you can use them as much as you want. Yeah, and um, we're actually going to throw up a slide about tear film. Um, the the gray is what we're calling a prosthetic surface, so this would be for a patient. Uh, this is very similar to the surface of a of a natural eye. Uh, the the green is the kind of uh, thin uh, mucin layer that as the mucus that we seem to produce lots of. Uh, the aqueous is, is not even really to scale here, is like 99% of a tear film or even more. It's like 99.9% .9 of a tear film is, is a watery layer. And then there's an oily layer. So the, the oil that we tend to, to prescribe to patients is, um, is only the outer film. And so um, what we're finding is, is that um, that's not enough. It's just oily. You've got mucus and oil working together with hardly any water in between. And so we're really trying to get um, uh, more either tears out of there by making people cry or getting, um, getting more artificial tears in. And we're just finding more and more that that's really needed. And um, I think that the the again, going back to that Kleenex and just trying to do all we can to get a tear film on there all day long for a patient is really going to help. And I heard at night that closing the eye yeah. is a challenge. Eye yes. masks. Mm -hmm. um, no, I was going to ask you, though. So my kids have been doing chemistry experiments at home, right, with soap and oil and water and just watching the liquid separation. So my question for you, then, is, you know, if there's that oily layer, how are we guaranteeing or, you know, how, I mean, I'm assuming it, it just develops over time, but, but is there a benefit to doing the oil first and then the liquid, or should we do the oil after we do the liquid so that it doesn't cause, you know, the liquid to just fall off? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, I don't know if it really matters as long as you get enough of both of them in there, but I think that uh, Dr. Nguyen was talking about, you know, his own uh, challenge with getting allergy drops in, and I think that T time is an element there. Time and, and whether the drops actually s get into the socket. And I think that um, uh, usually we have patients start with the oil first because you can actually, though it's thick enough, you can put it on your finger and you can drop it onto the front of it. Mm. Um, you could just drop a whole drop in too. But um, as long as you've got a few, you know, several blinks, like maybe a, a minute or so of like, really allowing that to get in there. Yeah. Um, but the challenge is everyone really wants to get it off their face right away because they can feel it on their cheek, it's dripping down their chin. Um, but it really would encourage just allow that to soak in before you get the Kleenexes and the, oh, and the, sense. And the fingers well, and I know, out. Like, it's so different. It's, it's fun listening to you guys. Like my ocularist says some similar things, but also some very different things. Yeah. Um, like he's really big on like, if he watches me put in eye drops and I don't lift my eyelid up, he's like, you're doing it wrong. Um, yeah. So, you know, some people may find that that's how they can get it back there. And I think it probably just comes down to personal preference and what ends up, you know, can you stay with your head hanging back long enough to let it sink in and be patient? Or do you have to lift the eyelid up and just manually put it there yeah, yeah. so keep the experiments yeah. up yeah. yeah but i think either way as long as you can get both in there i don't think it technically matters which comes first you can see on our slide here we say one drop of oil and several drops of tears so it's been a good combination for um most of the people that we've talked to about so yeah yeah now now we're making we're making a soup here i think there's also a possibility of getting an eye drop like um there's several that I've seen patients use recently that are a little bit of a combination of 
multiple things. So not just an artificial tear that has the aqueous, they actually have a, a lubricating layer in them. Now, any artificial tear is gonna say it's a lubricating artificial tear. It's a little misleading, unfortunately, because it is, because it's water, but it's not actually, if it doesn't have the, the multi layers of oil built in, or if it's not a suspension of, of some kind of a lubricant in uh, an aqueous um, drop, but Refresh has, um, I don't, can't remember the name of it, unfortunately, like complete or something. Um, I'll see if I can find that. But there's there's some uh, more interesting drops that on a on a sided eye would make it blurry for you for a while because they they're like a suspension. And for a prosthesis, it's excellent because that's exactly what we want. And in fact, I should say as a caveat, we would not want you to apply this to your sided eye because you're not going to be able to see for a while if you put a bunch of oil in there <laughs> and. Um, you're laughing because you've Oops. done it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we hear all the time about it, so. We are always gonna advocate for to wear um, protective eyewear if you're doing some things outside or um, just wanna protect your natural eye. Um, prescriptions, it's a big one. Um, we do our best to create symmetry with um, when we're making a, making your eye. And then if you put glasses on the top and you don't have balanced prescription, then there's not gonna be symmetry anymore in the, in the appearance of the prosthesis. So we always say, um, cause you can go to Costco and they'll say, oh, we're not gonna, we won't charge you for that side. And they put a blank one in and then you don't have the symmetry. So just make sure you balance the lenses and that will give you the symmetry that you need for a balanced appearance. Okay, and then uh, sports, uh, definitely wearing gl protective glasses, whether you're doing um, anything that has any moving parts or certainly machinery and uh, lawn mowing, yard work. There's a lot of close calls patients have. Um, and they tell me about it, so. Lots of resources out there. These are two books that we really like. This Making Life More Livable has like really great adaption, adaptions for eye loss. It's a really good one. It's kind of pricey. You can find it on Amazon, but it's a good one. Singular View has been out for a long time and, and um, edited many times. So that, that's really one guy's kind of personal story. So it's kind of quirky, but it's good. It's got some good helpful tips in it too, so. And then also physical therapy, occupational ther therapy, um, low vision clinic support groups, um, those are all gonna be great as well. Yeah, we have loved actually seeing stories of uh, patients really in the last couple of years that have come into our office knowing more about us than we know about ourselves <laughs> and that have really been able and prepared for the process. And I love that. I love the technology and kind of bringing people together in groups like this who have been able to get uh, um, much more preparation and more information to, to people when they need it. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about Okay, so what the practical things. So what, what are things people want to do and they still want to be able to do them? Uh, can you fly a plane still? Can you uh, be a dentist? Can you be a surgeon? Um, yes, yes, yes. I think the only thing that I have heard from a patient that they haven't been able to do is fly a fighter um, or you know, join the Air Force and, and be a fighter pilot. Um, for years I was telling kids, that they couldn't be a commercial pilot until I met one. And, and I was looking at him and he had come in to do a consultation and I, and I said, well, you're a pilot? And I said, so you like, you know, like cargo pilot? And he goes, no, flying people around in a box. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I got a lot of kids to go talk to. Um, <laughs> and we have a whole generation from like 40s, 50s of patients that were told they wouldn't be able to fly. You can't believe how many stinking pilots there are out there now because of that. <laughs> Tell someone they can't do something and they're going to find a way. So there we are. Fighter pilots, we'll see. Top Gun, you know. Um, uh, commercial drivers, commercial driver license. Um, I would say I'm not a huge advocate for motorcycles in general. We have an 18-year-old. Um, <laughs> he's heard enough of our, our, our uh, you know, just what we see from patients. And, um, uh, but in general, for a patient to drive, to do all those things, we just really encourage people to get into doing the things, but to do them well, to get the adaptions that they need. Cars, modern cars have great tools to help all of us with being able to see better in blind spots. And um, I think the, uh, the other things for, like, 
you know, actual daily living is try to not move your furniture around a lot. You know, do your things to keep your, make yourself successful, really counting those steps. Um, that's one of the bigger things I feel like I'm seeing recently from patients is they, they miss in that last step. Well, it's hard. Uh, it's really hard when you've got more limited vision. So really just take your time because you don't want the, you don't want the fall. Um, On a side note, I want to talk about this young man here because this was a pretty hopeful um, scenario. He came in and he did not want a, a shell. He has a shell, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did not want it. He was, his mom wanted him to do it and he did not want it. And so, but he eventually agreed to go through the process and um, this is the final picture of him. And now you look at him and he doesn't, he, I mean, he doesn't look happy, right? He's not happy right he, here. <laughs> but he looks fantastic. And now we have him coming back to see us. He's got long hair, dreads, the biggest smile. He's successful in school. He's playing sports. He is a changed kid. And I'm just so happy that he was willing to go through the process because his life has changed for the better. And it's just really fun to see how confident and um, just how much he, just the pride that he has in himself. So it's kind of a real fun one to see this picture and to now see where he's at now. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it has been for us a blessing to watch kids grow up, kids of all ages because we're all growing, but um, it's, it's, yeah, we had a, what a baby brought in a baby this week, like, she was a baby when I first saw her, and she's bringing in a, I don't know what they're doing, <laughs> so anyhow, um, the last things that we have are just our, our website, we have lots of blog entries, lots of, uh, lots of videos about kind of some patient stories that are fantastic, um, some resources for uh, clinicians that also can be for caregivers that, to help with how do you, it's a one page. Um, I think we have some out here, even if anyone wants them, just how do you take care of a prosthetic eye for all in, all in one little spot. And that's it for us. Thank you. Well, thank you. You guys, this was great. And I mean, I know most of us who already have a prosthesis, we all, we all love this stuff because this is, this is what has made our future and our, you know, the way that we can perceive ourselves possible. Um, so we're grateful for the work that you guys do and that you guys took, you know, this on as a profession. Um, let's give them a hand before we take a couple questions. <laughs> All right. So first question, average cost. What is um, the generalized, I mean, I know it probably is a range in the United States, but what would you say is the average cost of a prosthesis? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say that, um, it definitely varies throughout. I mean, I, we see patients that come here from all over the place, and so we have heard prices anywhere from like two thousand to uh, I want to tell you up to There's like forty five thousand. Oh wow! Like yeah, and, and it probably varies too. Like I would imagine, like the one that you were talking about, that's almost like that, like uh, the uh, is on is on Oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah. that that flat, yeah, that's like a, that yeah. Is a different Those are a little more expensive for sure because sure. um, there's a lot more more time and work involved. Uh, but I would say for a prosthetic eye, like in our region, I think around five thousand to seven thousand for okay. between a shell and a prosthetic eye. All right, so. Um, and then you guys already answered this one, which is that roughly every five years is when you anticipate people will need a new eye. So what's the reason for that? Um, is it tissue change? Is it, you know, I mean, I know for me, like I had my, my eye was done and then about three months later, my living eye, the color changed mm. and it kind of abruptly changed maybe due to supplements or just dietary changes, things like that. But, um, you know, are those some of the factors that can influence when you need an eye or is it comfort? Yeah, all the above can be the for sure. Um, but tissue change is probably the largest one. Uh, kids' anatomical growth, adults, we're still changing. Our tissue is still regenerating. So even though we're not kids and we're hitting puberty, we're still doing all the different things in growth. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of times in a, looking at a kind of you know lifetime for patients that maybe there's years where there wasn't as much change. And so we'll see someone's eye and we're like, man, it looks amazing. And then there's times where it could be just a couple years in and so much has changed and mm -hmm. colors can change. And so, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot. Yeah, that and we, we do not like to um, adapt a prosthesis after two years. 
Um, because if you're gonna add on to a prosthesis um, new, new acrylic, you're putting old acrylic and new acrylic together. And so that's kind of our general rule that like, if there's been tissue change and it's been past those two years, then for us, it's, it's we want to remake it. We like want a, a fresh acrylic in there and we want it to be healthy acrylic. Okay. So that's really that makes what sense. we do. So um, as far as, you know, the cost, um, is there anything that you guys would say that has helped or that you've seen patients in navigating um, insurance mm -hmm. or, you know, getting insurance coverage? Because yep. there's many of us in this room who have experienced something along the lines of insurance coming back and saying, oh, no, that's cosmetic, even though we have medical necessity, we have letters, we have all of the documents. So any tips, I guess, for navigating that insurance? Yeah, I would say that if, if you have flexibility with who your carrier is, there's, um, the, you know, our team works all the time with just this, is really to try to get the best coverage we can for folks. Um, there, if, a, if it's a, a Medicare age patient, there's some tremendous differences in coverage and plans. And there's plans that are pretty reasonable that cover 100% of the costs. Um, most of our Medicare patients are paying about 50% out of pocket. Uh, if it's an Advantage plan or, or non-plan uh, G or F, it's, it's about 50% out of, out of pocket. If it's uh, one of those G or F plans, um, it'll, it'll be covered in full. And so there's, I know there are different elements, of course, in healthcare, like what is covered and what's not covered. But um, some of our plans, we can do single case agreements. Uh, there's not very many oculars that are in network because we're kind of an obscure bunch, um, and it's 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 kind of more in the more in the fringe in healthcare. So I think that uh, for sure. Uh, advocacy with if your employer has advocacy advocacy groups I was going to say an advocacy group you know mm -hmm. for that sure that can be helpful uh, if and if you're getting no uh, we don't like that no, that word so much so we just figure out ways of how do we get there or is there another way um, and I and I would say too with with you know we we love what we do we are here because we get to care for patients and so if there's a if there's an obstacle that's in your way don't just come in Come in and talk with your oculus wherever you live. There will be a way. There's a way to get to. Yeah, to well, and, and the other thing to keep in mind, too, is, you know, just specifically for ocular melanoma patients, if you're not aware, we do have an ocular, uh, another nonprofit, the Ocular Melanoma Foundation, has an eye fund that is specific mm -hmm. to people, and they will, they will send out a scholarship based on financial need. And, it, you know, it is something you have to qualify for. Um, but if your insurance won't cover, or if, you know, even with insurance coverage, you're still footing a large bill that you don't have the money for. So just trying to, um, spread the news, I guess, of that to ocularists and to other eye doctors. Um, but I love what you said about how just, just that you guys, you know, yes, you're a very, a niche bunch of people who have a very unique artistry profession, but at the end of the day, you want to help people okay. and to not discredit the fact that, you know, if you think you can't afford it, still go talking, you know, go and talk to the person because they may have some level of a way you know, whether it's they help you fundraise for your eye or they help you learn, do a GoFundMe or, or they do something within office. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I think sometimes we discount as patients. We think, you know, we've, ex we've exhausted the generosity of the people around us. And I think sometimes we forget that it's other people's job to decide when they're done giving and that if we have a need that is a real need, it's okay. It's okay to put that forward. Yeah, yeah. love that. It's a great point. Great point. Well, um, do we have any other questions throughout the room that came up? Uh, if you did you write it down? Thank you, Hannah. We're just getting ready for our lunch break, but if you guys don't mind, we'll take a minute or so for the rest of these questions. Okay, so can you tell us, oh, have you heard about the 3D printing of prosthetic eyes? Is that something you guys have heard of or have seen people starting to do more of? Sure. What's your yeah. opinion, pros and cons? I'll, I'll add on to that <laughs> and say that, um, yes, absolutely. Um, there's, there's some great applications for other types of prosthetics, even including the orbital prosthesis that could be 3D printed ears, noses. Um, and there's, it's, it's definitely an emerging field. And um, in dentistry, they're using you know, 3D printing as well and, and, and milling machines and things like that. So for sure, there's a lot of applications that are out there. Um, we, ha we are starting to get biocompatible uh, acrylics that can be 3D printed. That was the challenge first, is there, there weren't biocompatible acrylics. Now there is. Um, the, the, um, I think the time saving and the, and, the, and the benefit of doing something, I, I don't know why our field always ends up in the 3D printing 
uh, posts because I get the Google feed of like prosthetic eye things. And for some reason, it always shows up and it says as a benefit of 3D printing a prosthetic eye that you could get three or 400 prosthetic eyes printed in one hour. <laughs> Who needs three or 400 <laughs> of these same artificial eye printed in one hour? I don't know what you'd do with that. Um, and so case, It's just in case you lose one. Yeah. Five million. I mean, there are some people that might benefit from that, but um, not very many. So the the... Some of the, the benefits of 3D printing are, are time savings and, and, and manufacturing, and I think that um, they don't align very well with what we're doing and our challenges in manufacturing. Our challenges are more along the lines of, of, of matching the tissue and getting it to feel comfortable, and so it's, it really is more of a mechanical and a one-on-one -on -one process. Uh, if it got to a point where you could actually 3D print the definition of the iris, which is certainly not in place right now, with colors and all of that, um, maybe. I mean, there might be some possibilities of that happening. So it's definitely an emerging technology that is kind of trying to find its place. And uh, the other thing that I would say is, um, is uh, cameras, taking a camera and t taking a picture of the of the iris and having that be duplicated. Um, it, there's a couple of uh, folks that are doing that in California. Uh, those higher yeah, price tags are actually digitally printed uh, in iris. alignment with that. Um, but it is, we see those. Um, we have patients that go down and get those and they come back and they see us and we make them another prosthesis and we're, um, I, I, as an as a clinician, I think that I would do whatever I could to make the best result for my patient. As an artist, I might bristle at that idea that we yeah, could. I, I love computers, I love technology, but the idea that we're taking away a, a paintbrush and, and putting a, um, you know, me in front of a computer to, to, to play with an iris for hours and hours and hours. Um, in some ways, we're just trading one thing for another. Yeah. And so I think that the idea and the, and the intrigue of it is there for sure, but I'm not sure the reality is is quite there. It's okay. improved yeah. greatly. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, come on, Wendy. Wendy's my special helper. She gets, she gets the mic. I'm going to say, too, like when it comes to like the idea of 3D printing, but I think a lot of healing happens in the, in the office with you when they're painting it, like, you know, they're looking at it. Um, but, I mean, I'll just say that for anyone that's thinking about doing a 3D. I'm not opposed to it, but I'm, well, I am personally. But <laughs> um, I think that a lot of healing happens in, in that moment, in particular with ocular melanoma patients. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's such For a good point. That bond between the ocularist and the patient is big. Yeah. yeah. So, Rob, will you? Nor could we. <laughs> So just for, just for those of us in here who were talking about, well, where's your picture of the little tattoo on the eye? Um, I, that was one of the things that I asked my ocularist about after talking to Wendy. And I was like, <laughs> I need it. Uh -huh. And my ocularist was very hesitant. He was like, why? You can't see it. I'm like, it's not about if I can see it. It's about knowing it's there. And honestly, I will tell you that the, I had a three-day process. That was how my ocularist works is it's a three-day you know, day in the office. Um, as far as the painting goes. And when he painted the actual iris, and then the next day when he showed it to me after it had the little tattoo on it, it felt like mine. Mm -hmm. Like that was the difference. Is He was telling me it looked like me and it felt like me when I had that little piece um, that was unique to me. So yeah. um, anyway, that's all the time we have for questions now, you guys. Find these guys if you want to check out the eyes he's got in his pocket. They're no longer in my pocket. Um, They're up here. I mean, those of us who have a prosthesis, I don't think we're going to take it out and show you right now. But if you want to ask us later, maybe. <laughs> uh, but thank you guys both for this wonderful presentation. All right, you guys, let's give them a round of applause. And just as you guys are finishing up for lunch, bear with me for a moment. I need to say a special thank you to Trisalis Life Sciences. They are one of our sponsors. And if you had the pleasure of being in the other room behind me with Dr. Katz, you got to hear him speak about um, just drug research development and all of that. So I hope you'll go back and listen to those recordings. But Trisalis Life Sciences is an interventional immunotherapy company who's on a mission to improve the lives of patients living with liver and pancreatic cancers by dramatically transforming the way these diseases are treated. So we are so grateful for them. Give them a round of applause and make sure to say hello.